saying it's not Easter, but we are going to be continuing to celebrate the resurrection this morning, one Sunday after Easter. But first, let's have a couple of announcements, and we're going to start out with uh, Mr. Mike Patska, who's got one for us. Good morning. And talk a little bit about our men's ministry. Uh, for those of you who are aware, we do meet the second Saturday of every month. We have a time of uh, praise and prayer time together. We usually have coffee and donuts. We meet again the second Saturday of every month from 7.30 to 9 a.m. This coming Saturday the 13th, we have an opportunity to serve. Uh, so it's not in the announcements yet, but um, we are meeting from 7.30 to 9 for another prayer and praise time. We'll be offering the breakfast. And also afterwards, we have a time uh, to serve. We're looking for six to eight men to help serve. We're actually gonna be putting together a shed at Pastor Ron's house. So if you wanna get some good points in with Ron, sign up. <laughs> and uh, so we're gonna meet and have breakfast. And then we need about six to eight guys. We need a few guys to stick around and help clean up for breakfast. And um, we're inviting all men. Um, also, we have a, our core group, which is myself, Tim Kenny, John Grabber, Zach Flogo, and James Levoy. If you could reach out to one of us sometime this week and said, hey, I'm, I'm coming just for the breakfast, or hey, I'd like to help serve, or hey, I want to do both, please let one of us know we need a count for how much food to make. Um, if you decide last minute you haven't contacted us and decided Saturday morning, hey, I feel like getting up, just come on up. We'll, we'll make it work. But uh, just encourage everybody, to, all men, to come to that. And any questions, please uh, let one of us know. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And then looking ahead uh, into May, we've got Mother's Day celebration on May 12th. Sunday morning, we want, you, want to give you a special invite and there are little cards, should be some cards on your chairs or perhaps beside you that you can use to uh, find some information out or use it to invite someone. Uh, it's gonna start at 9 a.m. and we're going to have a delicious complimentary breakfast and then the service, our regular morning worship service, will begin at 10.30. So we'd love to have you join us for Mother's Day if you are able. And uh, then I did want to also mention ways to give if you are interested in helping with the ministry here at Curtis Street. And so we've got four ways for you to give. We don't pass the offering plates but there are uh, several different ways if you would like to contribute. And that is uh, number one, electronically through your bank. And then um, on the website, csbf.org, there is a uh, web page for Tithely and you can use, give using um, Tithely. You can also give using the US mail. And then a new addition, which you may have noticed right back there by the double doors, is our new drop box for your offering. And if you uh, do use that, it would be a good idea. There are envelopes there on the side and you can make use of those. So four ways to help you and expedite your tithing and offering here at CSBF. Well, the early church began meeting on the first day of the week because it was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. That is why we have gathered together here in this place this morning. Josh McDowell said, no matter how devastating our struggles, disappointments, and troubles are, they are only temporary. 
No matter what happens to you, no matter the depth of tragedy or pain you face, no matter how death stalks you and your loved ones, the resurrection promises you a future of immeasurable, immeasurable good. I invite you to stand if you're able and take your hymnal and we're going to be singing a couple of songs with our hymnals this morning and we're going to be remembering and celebrating the resurrection of our Lord.
We find our comfort and strength when we abide. And we'll teach you the chorus, and then I hope that you'll be able to join in as you are able. And here's the chorus. You're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the well that never runs dry. I'm the branch and you are the vine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. I'd like you to try it with us one time and then we'll go to the rest of the song. Chorus. You're the way, the truth, and the life. You're the well that never runs dry. I'm the branch and you are the vine. Draw me close and teach me to abide. For my waking breath, for my daily Close and 
stands a three. Perfect submission. Well, you sound good from up here this morning. I can tell that you mean it when you sing those words. Our scripture reading this morning is John chapter 1, and we're going to be starting with verse number 43. And we're going to read it together, so if you wouldn't mind using the screen, you can have your Bible open, of course, and if you have the right version, you can read from there but otherwise we'll read it together. The next day, he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip, and Jesus said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him on whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. You may be seated. And let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we bow before you and worship you because you are the all-knowing and all-powerful God. We give you praise and honor because your ways are righteous and true. We give you worship for you are holy and just. Your loving kindness endures forever. We ask for your forgiveness for the times we have worked so hard to be self-sufficient 
forgetting our need for you, living independently of you and your spirit and word. Forgive us for letting fear and worry control our minds and for allowing pride and selfishness to rule our lives. Forgive us for not obeying the truths in your word. We thank you that your ways are far greater than our ways. Your thoughts are far deeper than our thoughts. We thank you that you had a plan to redeem us and that you made all things new. We thank you that your face is towards the righteous. You are close to the brokenhearted. You hear our prayers and know our hearts. We ask for healing for those who are dealing with pain and illness. We ask for healing for those who are dealing with emotional pain and illness. And Father, when we face life's difficulties and ask, why, Lord, give us more faith and help us to learn to trust in your sovereignty. We ask that you would help us to love one another as you have loved us. Teach us from your word this morning so that we might go from here better prepared to faithfully serve you. We pray you would work in us and through us so that we may make a difference in this world for your glory. We praise you and we bless you, O Lord. Thank you that you reign supreme and yet still hear the prayers of your people. And we love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, bye. Ron's coming up. I'm Tim Barsness. I forgot to do my introduction. And I'm one of the elders here at CSBF. And after the service, uh, my wife and I will be out in front, uh, right out there by the uh, fireplace. And we'd love to talk to you, answer any questions, or share a prayer request with you. Good morning, Curtis Street Bible Fellowship. Hopefully you received your notes uh, for today's uh, message when you came in today. So if you, if you did not and you would like a set of those notes, just raise your hand and one of the ushers will bring those right over for you. Well, if you're not there already, please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John chapter 1. And let me remind you here this morning before we be going too far, whether you're at the top of the mountain or the bottom of the valley, God is good all the time. Amen and amen. You know, one of my favorite things uh, to listen to is the believers, is other believers' testimonies. I love hearing how God saved you and what were the circumstances or events that were surrounding the greatest day of your life. Some of you here were saved at a very early age and you've lived your life for as long as you can remember as a believer. Others made a profession uh, early in life, but they really didn't make their faith their own until much later in life. Some of you grew up in Christian homes where the Lord was talked about daily. A powerful testimony of God's grace was evident for you as far back as you can remember in your life. Others did not grow up in Christian homes. In fact, some of you here today grew up about as far away from a Christian home as you can imagine. Some of you were living in rampant sin before God saved you. Your primary concern was what was best for you. You were entirely focused on satisfying whatever desire you had for yourself. But then something changed in your life. Someone introduced the gospel. You heard about a Savior who loved you, who died on a cross to pay for your sinful rebellion against a God you knew in your heart existed. You turned away from the kingdom of self and you turned to the kingdom of God. And you confessed and you repented and you believed by God's grace through faith. All of our stories are different, my friends. They are uniquely our story of God's redeeming grace intersecting our lives. We may have known about Christ before, but now we know Christ as our Lord and Savior. You no longer 
are who you once were. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new in Christ. You are a new creation, Paul tells us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And here is one thing we all have in common. None of us were exactly, are exactly as we were before salvation. Praise God for that. Amen? We may look the same on the outside, but on the inside, we are completely different. No longer a slave to our own desires, but now a child of the king. A change that came about when you met Jesus personally in your life. When you went from knowing about him to knowing him personally as your Lord and your Savior. Because no one can meet Jesus personally and not have their life changed. And that's exactly what we will see again today in, in our text as we close out these remaining verses in John chapter 1. We will live changed lives forever because someone introduced us to Jesus. And we went from knowing about Jesus to knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And incidentally, this is probably a great time to remind you of our key theme for the Gospel of John. So what is the key theme for, for John chapter 1? It is the prologue, right? So if you had to say, what is John chapter 1 about? What's the most important thing that you remember from John chapter 1? It's the prologue. What is the prologue? The prologue is like the coming soon attraction in the movie theater, right? It's the first 18 verses of John chapter 1 that tell us a snapshot, give us everything that's going to be happening and, and that uh, John is going to be walking us through throughout the entire gospel. Okay, the last time that we were together in the gospel of John, we looked at one of the lesser known apostles, Andrew. And we saw that Andrew was the brother of Simon who... Later, Christ named him as uh, Petros or Petra, which is Peter. Andrew lived in the shadow of his louder, more assertive brother, Peter. As I told you last time, Peter was one of those persons who spoke first and thought later, right? There was no on-deck circle between his brain and his mouth. It just went, whatever he was thinking is what came out. And even though he lived in the shadow of his brother who was certainly more prominent. That does not mean that Andrew's impact was any less significant. The one thing we know about Andrew is that whenever we see Andrew's name in Scripture, my friends, he's always bringing someone to Jesus. He's always introducing someone to Jesus. That's, that's what I want you to remember about Andrew. And if you're going to be known for something, especially if you're going to be known for something in all eternity, that's a pretty good thing to be known for, in my opinion. You were that person who was always bringing somebody to Jesus. So what made Andrew such an effective witness? Well, last time we were together, we saw the first quality we saw is that Andrew actively pursued the truth about Jesus. He, was, he wanted to know what the truth was. He wanted to know not other people's opinions, not what the world had to say. He wanted to know what does the Scripture say? What is truth about Jesus? Today, many people are indifferent to the claims of Jesus. But that was not true of Andrew. He actively pursued the truth. The second quality we saw is that Andrew actively considered the truth about Jesus. Not only was he seeking it, not only was he looking for it, and actively, he was actively considering it. He wanted to weigh all of it against the grid of Scripture. He wanted to deeply think about these things and not just not just as we would call today, have some Google theology. You know, what's my opinion on that? Well, let me go to the internet and find out. He really wanted to search through the scriptures and know for sure. And then the third quality we saw is that Andrew actively shared the truth about Jesus. Andrew, before he did anything else, he wanted to share the truth that he had found with his brother Simon. And remember, our role is to be a faithful witness, and that's exactly what we see Andrew doing with his faith. Now, in our passage today, we're going to meet a couple of other disciples. And the way in which Jesus calls them is different from the way that he calls John and Andrew. And the method in which they respond after being called is similar and yet uniquely 
different at the same time. But yet the Lord teaches us again today three more lessons about witnessing to help us become a more effective witness for him. Now, as we prepare to work through this passage, again, two very prominent names I want you to notice today. One is Philip, the other is Nathaniel. And we're going to spend a little time on both of them in our focus this morning, but our primary focus is going to be on Nathaniel. We don't hear a lot about Nathaniel overall in Scripture, uh, very limited times, but uh, we'll hear more about Philip coming up. But what we learn about Nathaniel in these nine verses will help us to become more effective witness for Christ. Well, with that as our background, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask him to bless our time together in his holy word. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for this immense privilege we have to gather together to open up your truth. Thank you for the freedom we have to worship you freely. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, work your truth in our hearts and our minds and that as we hear your truth, Father, as we pray each time we gather together, we wouldn't just be hearers of the word, that we would be doers of the word. We wouldn't just gather up knowledge for ourselves, or we wouldn't just be thinking, Lord, boy, this person next to me really needs to hear this, or this person in my life really needs to hear this. But we would ask, Lord, as we do each week, Father, what would you have me do with this truth first? How can I apply this to my life first and foremost in a way that would bring you glory? And that's our heart's desire. Lord. So we ask now that you would be with us in this hour. In Christ's name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. So you found your place now in John chapter 1. Let's look at verse 43 together. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now this next day in our narrative here this morning is actually day four. So if you can uh, go back and just kind of think through after the prologue in verse 18, from verses 19 to 28, that was day one. That was the day that John the Baptist spoke to the delegation that the Sanhedrin had sent. And then day two is verses 29 to 34. That's the day that John the Baptist describes the baptism of Jesus that had happened 41 days before. Day three is the day that John the Baptist repeats this statement about Jesus being the Lamb of God and John and Andrew follow Jesus and then confirm in their minds that he is the Messiah. And then later that day, Andrew brings Simon to Jesus, and Jesus gives Simon a new name, Cephas in Aramaic, or Petra in the Greek, which means rock. That brings us to the next day in our text. And all of these days are working towards this wedding in Cana, which will be John chapter 2. So now previously, Jesus had been in this area. I don't know, can you guys see that very well? Not very well, okay. Uh, he had been in this area of Bethany, which is located near the Jordan River. And this is located in the southern part of Judea, near Jerusalem. And it's here, this Bethany near the Jordan River in southern Judea down there, that the previous day events have all occurred. But now the text tells us that Jesus decided to go north to Galilee. And I want you to know that this is not just some random and impulsive action. This is a deliberate action by the Lord. There is a purpose in this decision. And it's going to lead to a very deliberate encounter. Jesus is not just wandering around the hillside trying to pick up disciples to see if somebody will follow him. He is purposely and deliberately gathering all those that the Father has given him from eternity past, just as he is today. Well, we see again in John 1, that Jesus found Philip. Do you see that in your text? And note the text is very clear. It is Jesus who found Philip. Philip did not find Jesus. Jesus found Philip. Sometimes people will say, oh, I found Jesus. No, no, you didn't. He found you. He is omnipresent, which means he's present everywhere all at the same time. And since he's present everywhere, if you believe you're apart from him, my friends, it's not because 
He is away from you. It means you're away from Him. And the good news is that He's here. He's there. He's still seeking and saving the lost. Well, now, what do we know about Philip? We know that he would become one of the 12 disciples. We know that the other disciples were Jewish, but Philip is not a Jewish name. He may have had a Jewish name, but we do not find that in the text anywhere. Everything that we know about Philip is found in the Gospel of John. None of the other Gospels give us any other details about him. And we're going to see Philip's name in John chapter 6, in John chapter 12, and then again in the upper room in John chapter 14. Also, it's important for you to know that this is not the Philip of Acts chapter 6 with the Ethiopian eunuch. They're not the same individuals. These are two different Philips. What we do learn about Philip here in John 1 is that Jesus told him, or Jesus issued a very specific challenge to Philip to follow him. Now, I want you to notice here also that Philip, or Jesus is not requesting Philip to follow him. It's actually a command. This follow me is a command. It's in the imperative. And the word that is used here in the original language is a command to follow him in discipleship specifically. As with any encounter with God, it is God that does the inviting. We don't invite ourselves into the presence of God. We are invited into his presence. We don't just determine in our own merit, hey, I think this is how I'm going to approach God and this is the way I'm going to do it and God will just accept me for the way that I am because that's how I am and, and he'll just have to kind of deal with that. No, you're invited into the presence of God. And that invitation is based upon the righteousness of Christ, which has been credited to you. And what an incredible privilege it is to be in the very presence of God because of Christ and his atoning work on the cross. Let's move then to John chapter 1, verse 44. And we see that Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. I want you to know that Philip had traveled quite a distance here, again, uh, it's about 20 miles, and it's highly likely that he traveled with Andrew and Simon since they're all from this little town called Bethsaida. That name, Bethsaida, means house of fishing or place of fishing, and it's located on the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. And since Simon and Andrew and Philip were from this small little fishing town, it's highly likely that they spoke to Philip about their encounter with Jesus the day before. Now, how did Philip respond to Jesus' command to follow him? Our text doesn't really make it clear, but we can be certain that his actions are consistent with someone who put their faith in Christ. What did he do that would give us this indication that he placed his faith in Christ after this encounter? Well, we see that in verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Just like we saw with Andrew after his encounter with Christ, we see the same thing now with Philip. We have this encounter with Christ, and then one of the first reactions is what? I need to tell somebody else about Jesus. And we see the same thing here with Philip. Again, we're starting to see this theme developing in the gospel where Andrew meets Jesus, and then he goes and tells Simon. Now we have Andrew and Simon introducing their friend Philip to Jesus, and then he in turn tells his friend Nathaniel. You start to see a pattern here where someone has an encounter with Christ. They come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and immediately the first thing on their mind is what? Somebody else needs to meet Jesus. I need to bring somebody else to Christ. And this is a pattern you're going to see throughout Scripture, beloved. We see believers inviting others to meet Jesus. This is what believers do. It's one of the marks of being a true believer, this insatiable desire to see others come to faith in Christ. Now let me add that none of us have the power to save anyone, nor are we ever called to save anyone. But what we are commanded to do is to share the gospel to invite others to hear the message of the gospel and to be a faithful witness. So, what do we know about Nathaniel? 
Well, in the other Gospels, he is known as Bartholomew, which means the son of Tolmai, the son of Tolmai. We don't know a lot about this relationship between Philip and Nathaniel, other than they are friends, and they were both seeking the Messiah. In fact, again, we see that specifically in verse 45. And you may recall that when Andrew went to tell his brother Simon about Jesus back in verse 41, he said, we have found the Messiah. But here, Philip says, we have found him of whom Moses and the prophets wrote. And then he gets very specific. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And that brings me to the first point in your notes today, which you were wondering if I was ever going to get to. So here we are. The first quality that we see is that Nathaniel highly valued the word of God. Nathaniel highly valued the word of God. The truth of God's word was important to him, which is why Philip approached him in this way about Jesus. Nathaniel was not looking for his own version of the Messiah. No, he was looking for the Messiah that lined up with Scripture. What was true was what God said was true, not just what others said was true, or not just what we wanted to be truth, but what does God say is truth? So for Nathaniel, truth is defined by the Word of God. And let me ask you, my friends, is that true in your life? Do you highly value the Word of God? Or put it this way, do you discern what you believe to be true against the grid of Scripture? Or are your beliefs and your convictions and your values, are they shaped more by the thinking of the word or the world rather than the truth of the word? So when we see how Philip approaches Nathaniel, it's very obvious that Philip believed that Nathaniel highly valued God's word and that he would make his determination about whether Jesus was the Messiah or not based on what the scriptures had taught about the Messiah. But even though this is true, it does not mean that Nathaniel could not be blind to what the Scriptures taught because of his own preconceived ideas about God. And we see that in verse 46. Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Point number two in your notes here is the second thing we learn is that Nathaniel's presuppositions were an obstacle to his faith. What does presupposition mean? It means we have these presupposed ideas, right? We presuppose something about someone or something without actually really knowing them yet. Why did Nathaniel say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I believe that he is astonished at the idea that the Messiah could come from such an insignificant place as Nazareth. I mean, Nazareth was just some small little farming community out in the middle of nowhere. Perhaps Cana, where, where, where he's actually from, but Nazareth? Come on now. I mean, the scripture said Messiah would be born in Bethlehem in Micah 5 2. You, you can't imagine that Nazareth, this insignificant little town, could be used by God so incredibly. And despite the high value that Nathaniel placed on the Word of God, his own presuppositions about God were an obstacle. They were a hindrance to his faith. And I believe the same can be said of you and I as well. Sometimes, my friends, we make judgments about whether people will re be receptive to the gospel based on our own presuppositions about them. Oh, they'll never listen to what I have to say about Jesus Oh, they'll just make fun of me and embarrass me in front of everyone else. I could never witness to my family. They know too much about me. Other times we witness to someone, and the minute they bring up a question or make a challenging statement, we interpret that as, oh, they're just, here they go, they're just shutting me down, when in fact they may just be sharing their own preconceived ideas about who God is. How should we respond to people who are struggling with their own preconceived ideas about Jesus. What should we do? Well, I think we should follow what 
Philip does here with Nathaniel. He says, come and see. Rather than arguing with Nathaniel, which is oftentimes what we as believers try to do, we like to dig in our heels, okay, here we go. We, our inner lawyer comes out, right? We're just like, all right, the case is on, let's go. But notice what he does here. He says to Nathaniel, why don't you come and see for yourself who Jesus is? I don't want you to forget that Philip is a new believer. It's not like he's an expert in apologetics or he just finished his master's in Old Testament theology. He, theology he's a fisherman, for goodness sakes, right? He's not been sitting on the tutelage of some great rabbi for the last 25 years. He's been out earning a living. He just is a new creation in Christ. He doesn't have five different apologetic approaches to memorize to respond to Nathaniel's objections. But what he does makes the most sense for him in this type of situation. He just basically says, check him out for yourself. Come and see the Jesus as he has revealed himself in Scripture. See, the antidote for the poison of preconceived ideas about Jesus is come and see Jesus for yourself, my friends. It's not facts about Jesus that saves you, beloved. It's knowing Jesus. It's about your relationship with Jesus. It's all about knowing Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Our faith is not rooted in a bunch of facts about the Bible. Our faith is rooted in the person of Jesus Christ. And until you meet Jesus, until you come and see for yourself, you can never truly come to the saving knowledge of him, the one without sin who became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So how will Nathaniel respond to Philip's invitation to come and see Jesus? Will his presuppositions towards Nazareth present him from seeing Jesus clearly? Well, we see that in verses 47 to 51, which brings up our third point this morning. The third thing we learn is that, Nathaniel's, is that Nathaniel had a sincere desire to know God and that ultimately led to his salvation. In John 1.47, we see Jesus' response to Nathaniel. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? When Jesus declared Nathanael was an Israelite indeed, he's simply saying that he has a heart to obey God. He wasn't the type of person, he was the type of person who was truly seeking truth. He was truly seeking to know God personally. He wasn't a phony seeker of God. He was not pretending to be a seeker of God. He truly was one. As a matter of fact, Jesus clarifies his remarks even a little bit further when he says, in him there is no deceit. That word there is significant in the original language. It's dolos. It's used 11 times in the New Testament, and it means to be deceitful or fraudulent or cunning, but in a nefarious kind of way, not a good way, not a wise way, but a deceitful way. And Jesus is saying Nathaniel is not like that. He's a man of integrity. He's a man of honesty. He's truly seeking. His heart truly wants to know the truth about the Messiah. He's the opposite of a deceitful, fraudulent man filled with falsehood. He's not just pretending to be a man seeking after God with his full heart. He is a man seeking after God with his full heart. This word dolos brings to mind someone like Jacob in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, the Septuagint uses the same word to describe Jacob, who later became Israel after he wrestled with God. In Genesis 27, 35, Isaac speaks of how deceitful it was for Jacob to steal Esau's blessing. That's the idea. One commentator said it like this, it would not be too far out of line to translate it like this. Here is an honest Israelite. Here's a man who's the descendant of Jacob, but who is the very opposite of the younger Jacob in character. 
Notice Nathanael's reply in verse 48. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, this seems like a pretty reasonable response from Nathanael, doesn't it? How do you know me? I don't know you, but somehow you know me. I mean, how do you know anything about me? I mean, Nathanael just met him. See, Jesus knows him already. But notice Jesus' response here. Again, before Philip called you, when you were underneath the fig tree, I saw you. Now, I don't, we don't need to, to speculate about all kinds of hidden meanings as we can discern by Nathaniel's response here. Jesus was clearly making a statement about his omniscience, his all-knowing. He's saying, I know all about you, Nathaniel. I know the in and the out. I saw your heart, Nathaniel, underneath that fig tree. I know what's in your heart internally. I know what's in your heart spiritually. And oh, by the way, I saw you physically, externally also, under the fig tree. My friends, the truth is, is that Jesus knew you too before you met him. He knew you before the foundation of the world. He knew you then. He knows you now. He loves you now. He died for you so that you could have eternal life by him or with him by grace through faith in him. Well, it's clear Nathaniel understood Jesus' response as nothing sort of short of supernatural. Because look at what he says in verse, thir- uh, verse 49. He says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Nathaniel went from questioning whether or not Jesus was the Messiah, and whether he could come from this rinky-dinky little place called Nazareth, to, Rabbi, you're the Son of God, the King of Israel. How did that happen in one sentence. That word rabbi is uh, a word for teacher, but it literally means great one. And Nathaniel's not done yet. He also calls him the son of God because he realizes that the one who knows the heart of men and knows and sees all things can only be God. And then lastly, he calls him the king of Israel. Jesus is the one that the Old Testament prophets had prophesied about. He's the promised heir of David who would rule on the throne of Israel and whose kingdom would never end. And there's no doubt in Nathanael's mind now that he truly is the Messiah. What an amazing transformation of the heart in Nathanael. <laughs> Remember when Philip approached Nathanael earlier, he told him he found the Messiah. Nathanael was like, yeah, right. Nice try, Philip. But now he's searching for the most eloquent biblical description possible to describe this new belief in the Messiah, in Jesus. And all of that occurred, my friends. I could take you all the way back for a second. It all occurred because someone was willing to take someone else to meet Jesus. All of this. Someone was willing to say, I know you have your doubts. I know you have your questions. I know you have your preconceived ideas about Jesus, about who God is, about what Christianity is all about, but I say to you, come and see. Come and see. Come and meet Jesus for yourself. I invite you to know him, not just think you know about him. Well, how does Jesus respond to Nathaniel's newfound faith? Well, we see that in verse 50. And Jesus answered him. He said, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? That's it? One sentence? You will see greater things than these. Jesus affirms his faith is real. He's correct in the titles that Nathaniel has spoken of him. But then he adds, you will see greater things than these. And he explains it now in verse 51. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, or amen, amen. I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What does Jesus mean by this? This is a reference to a dream that Jacob had while he was fleeing from his brother Esau. And we find that in Genesis 28, 12. And in that dream, 
He dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder that was set up on earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. In this vision of the angels descending a ladder between earth and heaven, in the Old Testament to Jacob, it depicted that there was going to be a bridge between God and man. There was going to be a bridge between heaven and earth. But here, Jesus takes this Old Testament truth and uses it as an illustration of a different kind of bridge that is now there between God and man. Except this time, notice, it's not a ladder. It's Jesus himself who's the bridge of reconciliation between God and man. It is Jesus who reconciles us sinners, hopelessly lost without God, into his presence, adopted into his family by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and his atoning work on the cross on our behalf. And Nathaniel and his followers will see more and more of this, my friends, this mighty work of Christ reconciling sinners to God. And you can too, my friends, if you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Well, I moved pretty quickly, so let me remind you of your notes in case I move too fast for you here. The first quality that we see, point number one, is that Nathaniel highly valued the Word of God. His view of who God was was based upon the Scriptures, not based upon preconceived ideas, right? The second thing we learn is that his presuppositions, his preconceived ideas were an obstacle at times, just like it is for many others. And the third thing we learn is that Nathaniel had a sincere desire to know God. And because he had a sincere desire to know God, he never quit pursuing Christ. And that ultimately led to his salvation. My friends, if you're here today and you've trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, praise God. Praise God that you're a child of the King. Praise God that you know who you are. You're adopted into the family of God, that you are a son or a daughter of the living Lord Jesus Christ. What an incredible, incredible thing that is. But if you're here today or you're listening at home and you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray today would be the day of your salvation. I pray today would be the day when you would seek that truth through the scriptures, that you would come and seek Jesus for yourself and not just rely on your friends or the internet to describe who he is, but you would come and see Jesus for yourself. That you'd put away any of your preconceived ideas or notions and truly meet the living Lord Jesus Christ. Because just like Nathaniel, if you do, the Lord diligently rewards those who seek after him. How do you do that? You need to recognize that you're a sinner, that you've rebelled against a holy and a righteous God, and that all of us have sinned. There's not one here who can say they've never sinned against God. The Scripture tells us that the wages, the penalty for that sin, that willful rebellion of ours against God is death, this eternal separation from God. That's the bad news. The good news is, is that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. He didn't say, hey, get your act together and then come and see me. No, he said, come and see me and I will transform you. That if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Not you might be saved, not you could be saved, not you should be saved, you will be saved. My friends, if you've never made that decision, if you've never fully trusted Christ, I urge you, I implore you, don't leave today without getting those questions answered. Come and see Jesus in his word. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for the truth of your word, and we are just astounded by your grace, which permeates through these scriptures, Lord. We're thankful, Lord, for those who have brought others to meet Jesus. We're thankful, Lord, that they were faithful witness 
to that truth. And we pray, Lord, that here at Curtis Street, we also would be faithful witnesses. And Father, not, not for us, Lord, but for them and for you. That they may come to know the living Lord Jesus and experience your presence, Lord, and understand what it means to be a child of the King. And Father, may that bring you glory. So, Father, help us to be faithful witnesses. In Christ's name we pray, and all God's people said. Well, we've been reminded this morning about how Jesus finds us. He calls, and we follow. He calls, we follow. And let's have this song be our prayer to renew our promise and our effort to follow him throughout this week as we go from this place. Bye. 